We all know season 4 is great. It's considered one of the strongest seasons of The Simpsons. But in terms of the individual episodes, it's not exactly a 22-way tie for first place. So let's rank these things, dang it. I took all of these episodes, callously tossed aside nine of them to get our semifinalists, and after at least five days of intense soul-searching, I eliminated three more. Here are my top ten Simpsons episodes from season four. Duffless is a nice breezy take on what would otherwise be a pretty heavy topic. In the retrospective video, I talked about how feel-good Season 4 is, and Duffless is a good example of it. Despite its name, it doesn't go super deep into the ramifications of Homer giving up alcohol for 30 days. That only starts up at the end of Act 2. The first two are full of satirical Duff Brewery tours, dramatic Alcanon meetings, and hilarious Troy McClure's shorts. We get a very good-natured and likable characterization of Homer, always smiling or negotiating or finding the silver lining. He doesn't get upset, he screams and jumps out the window. This is a Homer I can get behind. I could imagine a much darker and more miserable version of this episode, and I'm glad they kept this one light. Bart and Lisa's B-plot is memorable too, a fun little retaliatory story about science. Neither character is written entirely sympathetically, so we can just sort of relax and enjoy seeing them one-up each other. Although I'm pretty sure Lisa broke her brother in an irreparable way. The reason why Duffless lands at number 10 instead of higher, like most people would rank it, is that I'm not completely convinced that it really earns its ending. This is mostly due to its pacing. I mean, this is a very nice moment in a vacuum, but the Homer and Marge dynamics start super late, and as a result, ultimately doesn't hit that hard. However, what I do love about Duffless is the sheer amount of variety in it. It's part B.F. Skinner and part P.T. Barnum, and is packed with so many different kinds of humor, I can't help but come back for more. Man, Homer the Heretic is so darn chill. It's so chill, it's practically a bottle episode for Homer. He barely leaves the house in this one. Or even puts on clothes, really. So is it a straightforward pride cometh before the fall kind of story? Sure, it's not exactly breaking any narrative conventions. But the progression of Homer's characterization is so well done. He starts out in that very logical place, that we can understand why he gets addicted to Sunday mornings, I mean, he found a penny, wouldn't you? Then the episode turns on him, and he takes stuff too far. Very classic Homer sort of story, with a very Old Testament sort of retribution by the end. To be honest, this isn't a super satirical or cynical take on religion as a whole. I would guess most Christians really, really like this one. But as an exploration of the slothful side of Homer's personality, I can't really think of an episode that does it better. Just look at him. You want to know the only reason why Homer had to get out of the shower? because no soap radio. I will never understand why Flanders isn't in church when the fire starts. Don't know if he rushed home first or what. But whatever the explanation is, there's no denying how funny this ending is. Oof, that look of defeat. I don't think this episode is crazy deep or anything, but not every episode needs to be an angsty affair like Bart sells his soul. As a Homer-centric little parable about vices, Homer the Heretic works exceptionally well. Besides, the real meaning behind this episode is... Finally, a Treehouse of Horror episode makes one of these lists. You did it, Halloween. Let's keep this streak going. I love the balance of Treehouse of Horror number three. We get that holy trinity of a Twilight Zone send-up, a big film parody, and a broad horror concept. The scope of each story varies wildly, and the jokes certainly follow. Like, Clown Without Pity is the king of the character interaction jokes. We get the whole, that's good, that's bad exchange, and all the jokes between Homer and Evil Krusty. If you're not into the character interaction stuff, how about something that totally apes the style of King Kong? We get lots and lots of references, lots and lots of awesome Mr. Burns stuff, and a fun spin on the Homer-Marge relationship. If you're not into film parodies, let's just throw a bunch of zombies at Springfield and watch them eat some brains. Dad, you killed the zombie Flanders. The two knocks against this trials of horror is that none of the segments are particularly scary, even by the Simpsons standards, and they have a bit of trouble closing out their segments in a meaningful way. Especially with the Krusty story, they really went for the nonsense ending. 
However, where it might lack in thrills or even logic, it definitely makes up for in laughs. I would contend this is one of the most consistently funny Trials of Horrors. If you're tired of laughing at bad horror stories or malfunctioning Halloween costumes, give this episode a look. I like Homer's Triple Bypass for a lot of the same reasons I liked the Blowfish episode from Season 2. It gives us some character drama, a rundown of Homer's key relationships, and a bunch of funny jokes about healthcare. I think what this Season 4 version has going for it is that the core problem is more character driven this time, and gives them much more agency to do something about it. Homer's diet has always been terrible in the series. It makes total sense he would inevitably deal with this kind of issue. Using Mr. Burns for the breaking point is a work of genius, such a beautifully written and animated sequence. Then it deals with the practical issue that many Americans without healthcare struggle with. A lot of the satire still feels relevant over 25 years later. At least we have pre-existing conditions covered now. I think. I really like how punchy this episode is with its characters. It can bring in one character after another to deliver a joke and then go away. The stakes are high enough that there is weight to the scenes with the Simpson family. This Homer, Bart, and Lisa scene is one of the most underrated tearjerkers. Who said season 4 can't be emotional? It also features one of the most competent portrayals of Dr. Nick, who manages to actually complete the operation successfully. Just don't tell that to Mr. McGreg. Overall, Homer's Triple Bypass is one of those jack-of-all-trade episodes that somehow does everything well. And just writing about it made me bump it up one more spot on this countdown. Good job, Homer. Onward to number six. Lisa's first word is so ahead of the curve, it was doing 80s nostalgia before it was cool. If you want references to old stuff, oh boy do we have it. What separates it from other flashbacks is obviously the kids. We don't get a ton of looks at this point in Simpsons history. That entire era of Bart hell-raising was fairly unexplored. Honestly, it kind of feels like the Simpsons take on a Rugrats episode. Much like in the Nickelodeon series, they do an excellent job portraying those young adult challenges of raising a kid, and pair it with a simplistic character story for Bart that we remember relating to. In general, I love how impressionistic Bart's storyline is. How he kind of bounces between different locations and situations how surreal memories and phrases flash through his head. I think we all have random, incomplete memories of places and people from when we were very young. Bart's story feels very true to those memories. Hello, Joe. It also succeeds in being crazy heartwarming, giving us that double whammy of Lisa and Maggie's first word. I absolutely love that Bart is Lisa's first word, given how much these two have fought and worked together throughout the course of the series. Also love the sheer amounts of trolling over calling their dad Homer. They don't even make it a focal point of the episode, it's just this complimentary joke that sneaks up on you. Maggie closes this thing out in a really satisfying way. The ending doesn't quite hit as hard as the immortal do it for her, but what actually does? Lisa's first word is a well-constructed blast from the past that hits those nostalgic notes right. You know what's refreshing about a streetcar named Marge? That it's a serious look at Homer and Marge's relationship without having to sell the audience a love triangle. And no, this doesn't count. If you want Marnders, wait for season 15. Or season 21. Or season 29. Wow, the sexual tension is real. Anyway, Homer's an ass. He's not even an ass in an over-the-top destructive kind of way. It's the day-to-day -day assery that escalates things. It's almost Homer's enemy-esque, very self-aware and observational about what it would be like to be married to this oaf. But unlike that season 8 example, Homer actually puts things together. It feels very true to his character that he would figure it out through a work of fiction. I like how with Marge, all of these issues kind of bubble below the surface and it takes a lot of prodding to get it to come out. This is a Marge that is out there trying new things, is able to use some of that pain to put in a great performance. The actual musical of O Streetcar is such a beautifully silly send-up of the original play. I laugh every single time at that cheery closing number. It kind of breaks my brain how tonally dissonant it is. 
that Llewellyn Sinclair is some kind of postmodern genius. Also, I hate objectivism, and I am for any episode that pokes fun at it. Just the concept of Maggie going against an Ayn Rand daycare is hilarious on its own. Telling it via a Great Escape parody elevates it to something magical. Maybe it's because the references are so much older than other Season 4 examples, but a streetcar named Marge feels uniquely classic, like it should be shown in schools or something. Just maybe not in New Orleans. You know, for something that's basically a Homer gets a job episode, Mr. Plow really goes to a lot of interesting places. It doesn't waste a lot of time either. It's like, boom, cars wrecked immediately. Then it's car buying stuff, the auto show, and the snowplow. Then Homer failure, followed by success, followed by a rivalry story with Barney. All culminating in this big third act adventure sequence. It never quite feels like a shaggy dog story. That's probably the most impressive thing about it. None of these mini stories ever feel pointless or out of place. It's a nice combination of these down-to-earth concepts and wackier elements. Mr. Plow is down to wacky, and that's how Marge likes it. Like, just look at this pretentious nightmare. That ad executive deserved that punch in the face. Old Man Winter probably didn't deserve this kick, but at least this commercial has that home movie charm to it. I think a lot of the funniest episodes of The Simpsons can earn that reputation due to the density of their references, parodies, and their wacky tangents. I think what makes Mr. Plow one of the uniquely funny episodes of The Simpsons is how character-driven the jokes still feel. I mean, they brought in both Adam West and Linda Ronstadt, and somehow the humor doesn't feel that gimmicky. At least compared to other Season 4 episodes. Mr. Plow puts its characters front and center, and that's ultimately what I like most about it. I Love Lisa provides a combination of being one of the sweetest episodes ever with a lineup of killer jokes about Krusty the Clown and American Presidents. Who knew Valentine's Day and President's Day work so well together? Also Halloween? Ralph Wiggum is absolutely the best in this episode. We get the sort of doofy portrayal we're accustomed to, but it humanizes him as an outcast, someone even Lisa would avoid. It's very much in character that Lisa would feel sympathetic but then guilty about not having any feelings for him. It's kind of heartbreaking how lonely Ralph is in this one, how he is politely told no and pursues her anyway. You just want to reach through the TV and go, dude, no, she's just not that into you. Lisa is trying to be nice initially, but rationalizes into going to the show, ultimately humiliating him. Sometimes just trying to be nice at first leads to some very mean outcomes. Even if you don't care about all that Ralph Lisa stuff, Krusty the Clown and President's Day will keep you interested. Basically all of Krusty's jokes are flawless. Not just good, flawless. Sideshow Mel Drunk, Robert Frost, Krusty's Drug Trip, Sideshow Raheem, talking to the audience. Later we get the mediocre President song and Bart assassinating Milhouse. Finish him off! Also, I gotta mention Rex, who delivers one of the most delightfully smug faces I have ever seen in my life. Oh Rex, you were too good for this world. Ralph stole your part and then kicked you off of the Simpsons. Instead of putting the onus on Lisa to piece Ralph back together, I like that they let this kid deal with it on his own terms. You would never expect it from Ralph, which makes it all the more powerful. I love a good underdog story, and I love some sugary sweetness. So naturally, I am reasonably okay with I Love Lisa. So if Homer at the Bat was the sneak preview for the kind of stuff we'd see in Season 4, I would say Marge vs. the Monorail is the sneak peek for Season 5. This episode is wacky. And not even in the cutaway or one scene wonder kind of manner. Marge vs. the Monorail's wackiness is really big, the kind of bigness that envelops the whole town. Like, there are so many memorable jokes. The Mr. Burns stuff in Act 1, the entire Monorail song, Lyle Landley's confusing lesson plan, I Call the Big One Bitey, Batman's a Scientist, basically everything involving Leonard Nimoy. See, now I'm just resigned to just listing off jokes. That's how many there are. How can an episode with so many great visual moments be so quotable as well? It's not fair to the other episodes. 
We don't ever quite lose the Simpson family either, which is really important to these big Springfield stories. The episode doesn't have a particularly deep or intricate plot or anything. We get Marge intrigue stuff, but it doesn't turn into a mystery like the Sideshow Cecil episode. They have a good feel for how much to pull on particular plot threads, how to efficiently put characters in the best position to participate in the plot. Honestly, there isn't much more to say on this one, especially since I've already done an extra seconds on this. I could see the scale and silliness of Marge vs. the Monorail being a turnoff for some, but I think there's some room in Season 4 for one of these. If you're going to stretch the flexible reality of The Simpsons, you had better execute it well. Those jokes better be pretty darn worth it. With Marge vs. the Monorail, it definitely is. I remember when that article forever ago declared Last Exit to Springfield the best Simpsons episode ever. And at the time, I was like, really? That labor union one? Hearing that kind of thing makes me want to be a contrarian, wrinkle my nose at it, and declare it overrated. But I kind of can't argue with them. I mean, I wouldn't personally put it as the best ever, but it totally lives up to that legendary status. I think what elevates it above Marge vs. the Monorail, at least for me, is that it hits upon that character stuff more. It reaches similar levels of overall silliness, but with a more balanced sense of scope. Homer and Burns' stuff gets a lot of the love, obviously. Just look at this greatness. But I think Lisa grounding this runaway train is extremely important. It gives the plot some emotional stakes, something real that can drive Homer's motivations. And it's not just pity party Lisa too. This is important. She gives us some legitimately hilarious moments. I called the classical gas joke indulgent in the retrospective video, but I would never ever want it to be deleted. The drunken indulgentness of this episode is part of the fun. It's like the writers went on some bender and were like, hey guys, we got this episode idea. It's got monkeys on typewriters, burns falling out of a helicopter, an onion on my belt, mutated dogs, killer robot, an elaborate Get Smart parody, and Mr. Burns transforming into the Grinch. Oh, and let's say Dental Plan and Lisa Needs Braces for something like 30 seconds. And the crazy thing is that they got away with it. Every single one of these concepts work, not a single dud among them. The fact that they wrote this practically flawless run of jokes and decided to close it out with the corniest, most sitcom-y ending joke ever is just perfect. They know they hit a grand slam, they don't gotta keep proving anything to us. Just leave the gas on. So basically, no. Last Exit to Springfield is not overrated. It's the best episode of Season 4. If Last Exit to Springfield is overrated, then all of Season 4 is overrated. I don't think that logic holds, but let's just pretend like it does. Just barely missing out on this Season 4 list was a certified crusty sandwich and not even one of those gross crusty burgers they were selling in 1984. Camp Krusty landed at number 13, Selma's Choice in the middle at number 12, and then Krusty gets cancelled at number 11. To be honest, I was really close to just saying screw it and making a top 11 instead. I didn't want to get rid of Duffless, but all that Gabo and celebrity stuff gave me quite a bit of pause. Maybe I should give it a regular review sometime instead. These rankings are just one person's opinion, of course, so I'd be interested in hearing which Season 4 episodes are your favorites. Honestly, with this killer lineup, it's hard to go wrong. Just don't vote for the clip show. It's one of their better clip shows, to be fair, but come on. Up next is the deliciously wacky world of Season 5, featuring an all-you-can-eat buffet of nacho hats, all syrup squishies, a giant Rice Krispie Cube, and dangerously ruffled potato chips. I'm getting hungry just thinking about this one. As always, thanks for watching.